evening, everyone. Pardon me, online crew and everybody else while I get this in focus here. All right, how many noticed on your way here to church tonight the animals were lining up two by two? <laughs> it is good to have you guys out tonight. And uh, John, if you will, I got these to pass out as well. If you pass both these out, that would be super. Good to see you guys. I've got some good news tonight. Anybody want to hear some good news? Good news, it's been three days since Easter and Jesus is still alive. So, <clears throat> How many think that is good news? So appreciate that tonight. Uh, so what we are going to be doing tonight since he is still alive and how many believe that next week, if the Lord tarries and we come back, Jesus will still be alive. Next year, should the Lord tarry and we come back, he will still be alive. And even if he doesn't come back for another 100 years, Jesus is still going to be alive. But tonight, we are going to look in a few moments at John chapter 20, and when we do, we are going to talk about the resurrection. Now, some people might think, well, we just talked about the resurrection on Sunday morning, so I think I've got a pretty good handle on it. However, this evening, I'd like to encourage you that you are going to learn, you are going to learn some things tonight. Would you look at somebody and say, you're going to learn some things? What the, you know, if, if you're down in the South, the Holy Spirit might be saying to you tonight, you're gonna, I'm going to learn you some things. I'm going to learn you some things. So tonight, we are going to learn you some things with, through the Holy Spirit. But we want to open up in prayer. Good to see Chris and Elaine back with us after a long bout of sicknesses. Hopefully, you're feeling better. Uh, we pray that God will continue to touch you. Others are not able to come tonight either because of the weather or other things going on. But uh, if you're watching online tonight, we welcome you back. Victor, welcome back. He spent the weekend up to Faith Bible College International, hanging out with Jordan, spending the night in my brother's house. Was he a good host? My sister-in-law, and brother, they're awesome. So, Although my brother and sister-in-law, they just arrived to Alabama today. They're down for a wedding. So anyway, all right, we'll tell you what, enough chit-chat. Let's get praying. And uh, if, if you don't mind, can you grab somebody's hand beside you? Even if it's your husband or wife, go ahead, grab their hand. Uh, let's pray tonight. Father, through the name of Jesus, we come, and Lord, we appreciate you. We appreciate so much of what you, really all of that you do for us, Lord, but so much of what you do for us, we don't always understand, we don't always anticipate. Lord, we don't even uh, see it, but Lord, we know you do so much more for us than we'll ever, ever imagine. So Lord, tonight I pray that your blessing will be upon those who are here tonight. Lord, for those who are watching online, for those who would like to be here but can't come, Lord, I pray that there will still be a tremendous blessing resting upon them. But Lord, we ask for insight. We ask for wisdom and direction directly from the Holy Spirit tonight. We praise you, Lord. We honor you in Jesus' mighty name. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. 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 Well, since it is still uh, the week of the resurrection, and I referenced this song, but can we just sing this song before we get into it tonight? I, I mentioned on Sunday, this is one of my favorite Easter resurrection hymns. So sing it nice and loud, if you will. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. Sing it out. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He I see his loving care, and though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. Sing it out. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Sound 
salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. All right, now before we sing verse 3, it talks about rejoicing. And how many know it's easier to rejoice when you're on your feet? Some of you are like, I don't want to answer that because I know where that's going. Would you stand if you are able, if you need to be seen by all means, but if you can stand, would you sing this with, and we're going to take it up just a little bit. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ our King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good, so kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And He walks with me and He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Hallelujah. Would you look at three people and say, He lives before you're seated tonight. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. You may be sitting. God bless you. Thank you for singing. So glad to have you guys out. And I know a number of people could not make it in this evening. We miss them. But it's good to have you all out tonight. Uh, We are in the chapter from which our title verse comes, and it's this. Title verse is, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may what? Believe, this is one of John's favorite words in the Gospel of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now last uh, May I had the opportunity to be here, and uh, this is not a picture that I took, but this is what is referred to as the garden tomb. Now when you get over to uh, Israel, uh, a lot of times they will say, uh, that, you know, we, you know, if, if you want to pick a place where Jesus died, rose again, just pick a place because that could be it. But there are a couple of places that very well might be it. This is one of them, garden, uh, the garden tomb. Uh, one of the reasons that they talk about the garden tomb is because it's beside a place uh, that is referred to as the, uh, or, or some people have referred to as the place of the skull. Uh, it is a place of a rock effacement uh, that, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. How many remember the man on the mountain in New Hampshire? Remember the man on the mountain a few years ago fell to his death? Yeah, that rock former. Same thing happened with this uh, place in Jerusalem. Uh, back in the 1940-ish, 49, somewhere around there, the uh, front edifice, if that's the right way to set the front part of that fell off. So it no longer looks so much like a skull, but there are old pictures of it that it did. But when we look at, at uh, the Gospels, we see that the, the uh, tomb was not too far from where Jesus was crucified. This is referred to as the garden tomb. Now this was a picture taken in the beautiful sunshiny day, but I want you to remember that what we're going to look at tonight, the Bible says in John chapter 20, it was still dark. Would you look at somebody and say, it was still dark. It was still dark. And I want to pick up in John chapter 20, picking up verse number one, and we are going to have a lot of questions tonight. So hopefully you guys brought your spiritual thinking caps. Did you guys bring your spiritual thinking caps or did you leave them home? All right, you brought them. Good, because you're going to need them tonight. But uh, allow us to go through John chapter 20. Uh, We're only going to get through halfway through tonight, but it says this. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene uh, went to the tomb early while it was what? Still dark. And saw the stone that had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran, came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who was that disciple whom Jesus loved? John. Uh, now, sometimes we might think that John, man, he must have been a little bit arrogant to write that in. Hey, I was the disciple of Jesus' love. What about this perspective? What if we truly believe that the Holy Spirit inspired John to write that, and we look at John and say, John might have said, you know what, I don't want to write that. The Holy Spirit says, no, I want you to write that. That takes humility in and of itself. All right, so uh, verse 2, then she ran, came to Simon Peter, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, 
They have taken the Lord, uh, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter. Guys competing against each other, right? <laughs> Came to the tomb. How do you come to the tomb? First. John's like, I got there first. And, a, and he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And he saw the handkerchief that had been around the head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, John had to put that in twice, you know, uh, went in also, and he saw, and he what? Believed. For as of yet, they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. All right, going to start with a warm-up question tonight. How many were here in church on Sunday morning? Let me see your hands. All right, appreciate that. Uh, now, Katie and Pat, I know you were down to Lancaster, but I told you to bring back a doctor's excuse. Did you do that? No, all right. Well, for those of you who were here on Sunday morning, I want to ask you this question. What did I say on Sunday about Jesus being resurrected? That should be resurrected, not resurrecting. Jesus being resurrected on the day of the festival or the feast of the first fruits. How does that speak to you? What did I say on Sunday about Jesus being resurrected on the festival called the first fruits? God orchestrated it on purpose, okay. What did I say about the Feast of First Fruits itself? Okay. Jewish holiday. Follows, Follows Passover two days later. Nisan 14, which is the Jewish month. Uh, Nisan 14 is Passover. Nisan 16 is the Feast of First Fruits. Anyone want to continue to add? Celebrating the first harvest of the year. Very good. Celebrating the first harvest of the year. All right, let me just, uh, I, I, I'm going to quote somebody here today. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to quote myself here for my sermon on Sunday. Um, this is what I said word for word. Two days after the Passover holiday, the Jews observed the Feast of First Fruits. What was the Feast of First Fruits? It was a holiday that, uh, uh, I lost my place here. Uh, it was a holiday that got instituted during the 40 years in the wilderness, but it was not to be observed until they entered the Promised Land. It was a holiday for God's people to remember that God is the giver of the crops, by taking seeds that are what? Dead, and from them he brings life in fruit. The barley crop would have been the primary grain that the children of Israel would have used for this holiday. The people were to bring a sheaf, a bundle of grain to the priest, who would do what? Wave it. Would you wave at somebody tonight? They would wave that sheaf, wave that grain before the Lord as an offering to express gratitude for God taking that which was dead and bringing it back to life so that fruit could be produced. I do not want you to miss the significance that Jesus Christ was brought back to life on the feast or the festival of the first fruits. That which was dead was brought back to life. How many think God had a plan in mind? Let me try that one more time. How many think God had a plan in mind? Not only was he crucified at the Passover season, he was raised back from life. Now, Verse 1 says, it was still dark. And I want to give you an opportunity. If you were given the assignment to preach, if you were given the opportunity to preach that part of the verse, how might you preach it? It was still dark. I want you to put your preaching cap on, your thinking cap on. You were given the opportunity to preach it. How might you flow with that angle? It was still dark. The light was soon to appear. Okay. Can you go? That's good. That's good. They felt hopeless. They felt hopeless. Jesus, as far as they knew, was still in the ground. They, they felt about as low as they'd ever been in their life, probably as low as they'd ever been in their life. It was a desperate, desolate time. So many of them had had dreams that Jesus was going to be the Messiah, and they could not understand why Jesus was killed. And, and if, if Jesus had even gotten to the cross, but before he was killed, Jesus just said, that's it, I'm done. And he threw off the Roman soldiers and they went flying and lightning came down and struck everybody. Then they would have been a great celebration. But he died on a cross, was buried in the ground. The Roman government sealed it up. 
Soldiers were standing there, and they came to the ground on that Sunday morning thinking Jesus was still dead. It was dark. Now, I want you to remember, three times in this chapter, Mary Magdalene is greatly concerned about the location of Jesus. Keep that in mind. Three times she's, she's concerned about that. But as we get to verse 6, we discover that even though John got to the tomb first, Peter was the first one to go in. Why might, why might that not surprise you that Peter was the first one to go in? He's bold, he's impetuous, he's the one that just takes action sometimes without speaking. But then in verses 6 through 7, they say that Peter saw the linen cloth lying there. 7, and the handkerchief that had been around, I'm sorry, verse 6 and 7 say, Peter saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but notice what it says, folded together in a place by itself. The New Living Translation puts it this way. He also noticed the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there while the cloth that covered Jesus' head was what? Folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. How could verse 7 help to convince someone that Jesus' body was not stolen? Chuck. Chuck. All right, you are going to, you're segueing beautifully in what I'm going to address here in a moment. So Chuck, hold what Chuck said in mind, because I'm going to revisit that here. Uh, Pat? Uh, from my understanding, it's the most studied artifact today. It's called the Shroud of Turin. They don't have no idea what caused the image of his face on there. Um, they know it's to the. They try to discredit it like 20 years ago, saying it was physical all the way back 2,000 years. But then they realized it was taken from a piece of, from the outer piece because it went through a fire or something. And but they've since now proved it does go back 2,000 years. There's pollen from Jerusalem, all these things, uh, all the evidence of a crucified man. But the most beautiful thing is his face. It's like hard evidence of his resurrection. They. There's no power on earth. They don't know how to replicate that. I actually listened to a team that went over there and a bunch of atheists wanted to prove that it was a paint job or some kind of, a, you know, artist job. And they realized one thread was shadowed, one was not. It was totally blazed on there. It just, the head came through that. Yeah, and, yeah. Shroud of Torin, we, we, we don't know. It's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge believer in the Shroud of Torin, but I'm not going to discredit no. it either. Yeah, well, it's, um, but it's a whole it's I, if you listen to a whole team of people, a lot of them were atheists and they came way like that's powerful. Oh, this has to be. There's no what other explanation is yeah. there? Yeah. Good. Praise God for that's that. Awesome. All right. Kathy and then Pastor Josiah, unless they duplicate their answers here. <laughs> to answer your question, if I was gonna steal a dead body, I'd want to keep the face covered. I wouldn't want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Josiah? So I'm gonna say something along the same lines. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, most most Grave robbers are of the mentality of leaving the place better than you found it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in case you're online, most grave robbers aren't in the position of leaving a place better than they found it. So think about this. If you're going to steal a body, number one, it's, it's nearly impossible to get in past the Roman guards. We get that. That's not going to take place. You're not going to risk your life. You're going to go in, steal the body, and say, you know what, before I steal this body, let me undress it. You know, let me take all the strips of cloth, 100 pounds of ointment off, uh, and the perfumes, all of that. And then... Notice, though, the, the, the folding part, the handkerchief around was folded. Are you going to then say, oh, guys, before we leave, let me just take time to fold this up and put it nice and neat and orderly, okay? So that, that's one argument against. Now, Chuck Morris, you helped segue into my point. Let me, let me ask this question. <clears throat> um, besides Chuck a few moments ago, let me just get my bearings here where I am with my notes. Uh, actually, let, let, before we get there, I, I, I do want to touch on something else first. I'm sorry. Hold that thought, Chuck. All right. I, I want you to notice, uh, Matt, in, in John chapter 20, verses 5, 7, and 8, there are three times that the word saw or seeing is used. And I want to just have you kind of understand a little bit of the differences in the Greek words used here because it helps paint a little bit broader picture. Now, I don't want to just throw the English language under the bus. I think the English language is a beautiful language, but many of you have heard it said that sometimes in English, there just aren't words to convey what other languages have. Uh, I, I know you, you went down to Central America and other people have been around different parts of the world. You know, sometimes the English language can be a little bit uh, short in its definitions. But I, I want you to listen to three words here. Uh, the word saw, S-A-W, the verb, I should say, 
there are there are three words, and the first word that's used in verse five, and I want to talk about this here in a second, is the word blepo. Someone say blepo. Blepo. Isn't that a fun word to say? <laughs> Would you look at somebody and say blepo? All right, now the Bible says in verse five that John saw he blepo. He saw the linen cloths lying there. Now, what that word means is to physically see or to survey the scene without any, if I can put it this way, without any judicial thoughts. In other words, you might be walking by and you say, hey, there's people in the room. That's just blepoing the room. You saw the room, you saw what was there, and you just keep on walking. But the second word found in verse 6 is the word thereo, if I'm saying that even correctly, right? Uh, and, and we get the word theater from that. When you think of this word uh, thereo, Think of the word theater like when you sit in a theater and you observe a very, uh, you know, you observe a, a play and you carefully notice what's going on on the stage. You're observing and you're trying to study the whole picture in order to form an opinion. Verse 6 says that Simon Peter came following John and went into the tomb and he saw, he thoreo, the linen cloths and the handkerchief. Peter was like, hmm. I wonder what all this means. Would you take a look at that? So we've gone from just a cursory view that John has to then a little bit deeper pondering view. But then in verse 8, the third Greek word is the word idon, uh, E-I-D-O-N, or ido, from which we get uh, the word saw. But we also, it's in Latin, it comes with the word video. Uh, and, and John, when he saw, the Bible says, when he saw, he believed. Now, this word idon, it means to see with comprehension, to see with perception, and to see with understanding. That's why it says he saw and believed. And let me ask you this question. What do you suppose he believed when he saw with comprehension, perception, and understanding? What do you think he believed? Not a trick question. Yeah, I believe that all of a sudden there was something that was stirring inside of him that says, hey, I think Jesus just very well might be alive. Now, how many have, before Chuck mentioned, how many have heard the illustration of the folded napkin concerning Jesus' grave? All right, a few of you, just a few of you tonight. Uh, I want to give you a real-life illustration. I found this on the Internet this afternoon. And if it's on the Internet, it has to be true. Abraham Lincoln said so. All right, now, <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is a beautiful illustration. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, now the King James Version is where we get the word napkin. New King James Version uses the word handkerchief. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, we need to understand a little bit about the Hebrew tradition of that day. The folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant, and every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure that it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished perfectly, and then the servant would wait just out of sight until the master had finished eating. The servant would not dare touch the table until the master was finished. Now, if the master was finished eating, he would rise from the table, wipe his fingers and mouth, clean his beard, and wad up the napkin and toss it onto the table. The servant would then know to clear the table, for in those days the wadded napkin meant, I'm finished. But if the master got up from the table, folded his napkin, and laid it beside his plate, the servant would not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. Let, let us be reminded daily during the post-Easter season, Jesus Christ is not finished. He is coming back for his faithful servants within the church. Now, the problem with that story is it's not true as much as we'd like it to be true. Uh, and, and I want to present to you an article, and the reason I want to take a little bit of time tonight is not so much to burst your bubble. You know, Chuck Morris, I, I apologize. I don't mean to burst your bubble in a beautiful illustration. That's right. It, it's on the radio. It's got to be true. But, but even in preparation, I was listening to a very respected minister that I, I enjoy listening to. Smart, brilliant mind. But I heard him use this illustration as well. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, hey, we're going to prove him wrong. No, no, no. It's just I want us as a body to make sure that what we're saying, even if it promotes Christianity, is still true. Uh, I don't know about you, but e even if it's against politics or someone you may or may not like, I want, I want Christians to be people of their word, people of truth. Somebody say amen to that. Now, you have handed out tonight uh, a paper that's from the Jerusalem perspective. And the first word, it's in small print. I know that it is, but it says the theory. And I'm going to read this tonight because I, I want us to kind of gather an understanding about how we can 
interpret the Bible better and not be gullible to fall for bad uh, stories or fables that even if they promote Christianity, that, that may not necessarily be true. This is just a way of kind of de- debriefing coming down on this, uh, this little story. The theory of the significance of the napkin in Jesus' tomb is a good opportunity for us readers of Scripture to sharpen our critical thinking skills. We now live in an age of disinformation and conspiracy theory theories when we certainly don't want to believe everything we hear on a podcast or read on the Internet, not at least without checking our sources. It's important to ask ourselves, have we learned how to spot a conspiracy theory or an urban legend when we see one? The napkin theory bears several marks of disinformation. The napkin theory scratches an itch. I want you to think about that tonight. Uh, John, do we have any more copies of that? Uh, let me grab one copy because that's got bold. I didn't bold print mine. Um, but notice uh, it's, he says that the, the, the napkin theory scratches an itch. Would you just kind of scratch your arm for a minute? It scratches an itch. What do I mean by that? Well, in John 20, verse 7, we encounter something we don't immediately understand, the folded napkin, and we assume it must have significance. Why does it have significance? But is this assumption a safe one? Maybe the folded napkin isn't trying to communicate something. Maybe it's simply reporting an incidental detail. For instance, it is significant that the tree, for instance, is it significant that the tree Zacchaeus climbed was a sycamore? Does the tree species have something, some spiritual significance, or did it just happen to be the nearest tree that was the easiest to climb? The same holds with the napkin. Why does it have to communicate spiritual, a spiritual lesson? Is there really something there in the text, or are we just scratching an itch? Second, the napkin theory relies on unsourced data. When I went through seminary, uh, you know, one of the goals for every person trying to do a paper was make sure you try to get back to the primary sources, primary sources. We are blessed with numerous, sor- numerous sources that inform us about life in the Second Temple period, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the works of, of Philo and Josephus, rabbinic literature, and the New Testament itself offers a wealth of knowledge about what daily life for ancient Jews and Israel was like. But the napkin theory doesn't rely on any of these sources. It vaguely refers to a Hebrew tradition, which was in the wording that I read earlier tonight, that no one can actually point to. Search the internet when you go home. You will not find an, any primary source for this. Lack of corroboration corroboration should set off alarm bells. If a theory scratches an itch and it relies on unsourced data, then we should start to get suspicious that we're dealing with false information. Third, the napkin theory doesn't hold up to scrutiny. When you think about it for a moment, the napkin theory doesn't make sense. It is clear that the napkin that covered Jesus' head wasn't used at the dinner table. It was part of the grave clothes that covered Jesus' body. Jesus wasn't eating a meal in the tomb. So table etiquette can't help us determine the significance of the folded napkin if there is any significance to it at all. Four, the napkin theory works in our context but not in the original context. The only reason the napkin theory works uh, is that in our English-speaking context, a napkin is usually an item that is used at the dinner table. So we jump from thinking about grave clothes to thinking about table manners. But, listen closely, the Greek term however you say that word, sodarion, like the Latin term sodorium, refers to a face cloth for wiping sweat from the brow. It would also be used as a face covering or shroud for burial. Napkin, in other words, is misleading translation from the King James Version. A sodarion is like a napkin that is a small piece of cloth, but it's unlike a napkin that is that napkins are used at mealtime, so sodarion is not. But the napkin theory runs wild with connotations that are, original, that are, that are appropriate to use, I'm sorry, that are appropriate to use of napkin in English-speaking context, but it's nonsensical in the original Greek context. In order for an interpretation of the Bible to be true, it must make sense in the original language. Interpretation of English uh, translation do not make sense in the original languages of Scripture are, are of necessity false. And then fifth, the napkin theory offers the promise of secret knowledge. Being in the know makes us feel good. It gives the insider information that other people don't possess, and it makes us feel as though we have to attend a deeper, uh, we have atten- attained a deeper insight that other people have achieved. This is the allure of secret knowledge. But such secret knowledge typically has a way of reinforcing that, uh, reinforcing what we already know to be true, believe to be true. It confirms uh, it confirms us in our previously held beliefs. Real knowledge challenges us. It doesn't confirm our biases. It expands our horizon. New knowledge often makes our un- makes us uncomfortable because it doesn't fit nearly neatly into the confines of our preconceived notions. True knowledge humbles us by challenging us to think more deeply, but secret knowledge makes us strong. 
This false interpretation of Jesus' folded napkin relies on doubtful, unsourced information about the table manners that doesn't even apply to burial customs, but rests on unsound associations with the English word napkin. It doesn't hold up to the least uh, up to the least scrutiny and should be dismissed out of hand. But you don't have to take our word for it. Use your critical thinking skills to judge whether the napkin theory is true or whether it's leading you down the wrong path. And there's a takeaway there. I won't read that. Uh, but one thing, too, is interesting that uh, when you study this, uh, the, the Jews did not even use napkins. They just they would eat, they would wash beforehand, but they did not use napkins afterwards. So the reason I go through that tonight is just to help us understand that when you come to something that someone may say, for instance, a pastor might, might come in, myself, a preacher, someone else, an evangelist might come in and, and preach something. You're like, wow, that's good. And what can often happen is, you've heard me say this before, heresy rides in on the back of truth. And so what happens is someone says something with a little bit of a different nuance because it gets excited, people all excited. And then next thing you know, there's a following, there's a dissension in the church. Why? Because this nuance is what it means when you really begin to look back at the history of things and that's not what it means at all. Spent that time just to say, be careful. Be careful about your interpretation of Scripture. Would you look at somebody and say, be careful? All right, now, verse number 9 says this. Uh, as, as yet, they did not know the Scriptures. All right, they, believe, they went in, saw the, you know, the, the, the burial cloths, all of that. Yet, they did not know the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. I want to ask this question. When you read that question, they did not know the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. What question begs to be asked when you read verse 9? I want you to think about that for a second. Read verse 9 again and then ask yourself the question, what question begs to be asked from that? How could they not know? Okay, uh, Kathy, before I call on you, Debbie, I'm calling you Peter or John right now. All right, so Mrs. Peter, how could they not know? How could they not know that Jesus was going to raise from the dead based upon the Old Testament scriptures? It was already predestined that the Lord was going to rise from the dead, so how could they not know? But, all right, I'm, I'm, just going to, I'm just picking on you here. How do you know that? Because it says so in the Bible that he told them. He was no, we're not talking about what Jesus said. We're going back to the Old Testament. <laughs> All right, Kathy Lechner. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, and then there are some passages that are quite explicit that you can't really mistake the meaning. But these disciples were not rabbis; they were not taught Scholars. the same. I mean, they might have been taught what the typical Jewish boy was taught for bar mitzvah or whatever they did back then, but they weren't taught like the rabbis how they didn't know the scriptures the way. Yeah. So, so the yeah. Religious leaders knew them. Yeah, I agree. So here's here's the answer to that question. If if we read that, like Kathy said, they yet did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. The question that begs to be asked is what scriptures in the Old Testament reference Jesus raising from the dead. Pastor Josiah? The Psalm of David, he won't allow my anointed one to see Sheol. Very, very good. Uh, that's one of the verses we're going to look at here in just a second, so very good, Josiah. Um, let me ask this question first. Pastor Josiah, just answer this question without even knowing I was going to ask it. It's kind of like Jeopardy. Can anyone think of any Old Testament scriptures that reference the Messiah coming back from the grave? Okay. I'm not necessarily going to expect you to answer because I had to do some digging and research myself, but let me go down some of these scriptures. I apologize they're in small print. But Psalm 16, verse 10, Pastor Josiah just referenced this. Very good. Uh, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now, uh, allow me to read through these, and then we're going to come back and just kind of help you interpret through some things here for a moment, okay? Psalm 110, verse 1, messianic passage here. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. We've talked about that passage before. That's a tough, tough passage to understand. But once you get that down, you're like, wow, that makes sense. And that's one of the most quoted uh, Old Testament references in the, uh, in the New Testament. Isaiah 53, 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. 
He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offering. He shall prolong his days. Notice that. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper at his end. Hosea 6, 2, perhaps a veiled reference. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. And one that maybe you guys should have caught. Jonah 1, 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, the only reason I say you maybe should have caught this is because Jesus plainly referred to this as a sign. You remember Matthew 12, 40? For just as Jonah was with was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, let me say this. When I read the book of Matthew, Matthew in particular, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew was written largely to whom? Anyone remember? To the Jews. Largely written to the Jews. Luke and John, not so much written more to the Gentile world. Uh, Mark written to Romans, most likely, but... but Matthew really deals with, with writing to the Jews. So therefore, you often will see when you read the book of Matthew, this was done that it might be fulfilled by the prophet Isaiah, dot, dot, dot. Or this was done that it might be fulfilled. This was done that the prophecy might be you know, fulfilled. You see that time and time again. And when I read Matthew, you know, I, I went to Bible college as well as some of you did. I went to seminary. And, you know, we talked about hermeneutics. And Pastor Josiah, what is hermeneutics? Properly interpreting the text. Yeah, properly interpreting the biblical text. Hermeneutics, interpreting the biblical text properly. And Pastor Josiah, Kathy, Pat, others who may have gone to Bible college, I don't know about you, but when I look at Matthew, sometimes I say, Matthew, you didn't learn good hermeneutical principles. Do you ever think that? Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, Charlie? Were all those Old Testament books written before the resurrection? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Malachi is the last one that was written somewhere around 400 something BC. So yeah, you're talking 400 BC and back. Yeah. So Matthew uh, applies some, and, and really a lot of the even Jesus himself. Jesus himself does not have good hermeneutical principles. However, his hermeneutical principles are a whole lot better than what I learned in seminary. What do I mean by that? I, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go something again a little bit deep here with you for a moment. Uh, this I, listen, I'm going to read this article with you, and I do not expect you to go here from here tonight and say, "Wow, I got it, I understand it better." This is just going to be something to kind of whet your appetite about how you deal with scriptures. How should we view the Bible? Why don't you pick up that second article that's stapled together that you have tonight? Uh, or actually, do I, do I, do I have, no, 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 I, you know what, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, scratch that, uh, just listen to me, okay, listen to me, this, this is, I'm sorry, I got jumping, I'm jumping ahead here, listen to what I'm about to say, because this is one, this is one author, I don't know the author's name, uh, but it's on the uh, website, christianitystackexchange.com, but listen to how this person responds to this question about what scriptures were they referring to. When it says they knew not the scripture, it is talking about a verse or verses from the Old Testament, such as Psalm 1610. They did not yet know the resurrection is what the Old Testament taught. Now, we can't look, I mean, it would be nice if you could look at, say, the book of Jeremiah and saying, the Messiah is going to be crucified, but three days later, he's going to rise from the dead. But we don't see that directly spelled out. So how, how is it that Jesus kind of scolded the disciples for not understanding scriptures? Or how did John look back and say, you know, we just didn't understand at that point. So when they were taught about the coming Messiah in their synagogues, they were taught he would be a conquering Jewish hero who would drive out the hated Romans and make Judea a great nation again. We get that. Were they anticipating a Messiah dying? No. So how they interpret a Messiah right, raising from the dead? There was no belief of a Messiah who would die and rise again. Their idea of a Messiah was material, not spiritual. He wasn't going to come and save from sin and bring spiritual freedom. They thought he would come to save merely from political oppression. And of course, all the Jews thought that the physical Jews, I'm sorry. And of course, all of the Jews thought that the physical Jews were all of them, the people of God, and were all going to receive the messianic benefits when he came. So for them, the kingdom of God or heaven would be the non-spiritual kingdom of the Jews restored to glory by military success. Listen to what I'm about to say, because this is where, again, I'm not going to ask you to understand this fully, but at least to whet your appetite. 
So whenever Jesus told them of his death and resurrection, they simply didn't get it. It didn't fit their false understanding of the teaching of the Old Testament concerning the coming Messiah. In the Old Testament, the resurrection is taught, number one, explicitly, two, by implication, and three, figuratively, by types and shadows. Number one, it's taught explicitly. I, I might not necessarily use the word explicitly here, but I'd, I'd probably use the phrase very close to explicitly. Psalm 1610 and Psalm 110 and following. If he, it's, it, it talks about the Messiah, and he says, if he will sit next to God until he makes his enemies a footstool, then the Messiah must sit there before and not merely after the day of judgment. So he must be raised from the dead before the general resurrection of all mankind. What he's saying is this is that if the Messiah is truly going to fulfill the promises of the Old Testament and, it, then, and, and he's going to be killed, like Isaiah 53 talks about, then these prophe prophecies of, of Psalm 1610 and Psalm 110 uh, have to be fulfilled quickly. So how is he going to go? How is he going to die? Be a suffering Savior? By his stripes? All of that? He's going to raise quickly from the dead. So explicitly we can see that this was spelled out. And then by implication, 2 Samuel chapter 7. If he will reign forever, then he must live forever. The, the prophecy in 2 Samuel, you may recall that uh, David said, Hey, God, I want to build you a house. And you remember what God told David? Basically, this is my kind of paraphrase, but you want to build me a house? Mm -mm, that's not happening. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do because of your desire. I will build you a house. That's the Davidic covenant. The Davidic promise is that I am going to establish a house for you, not a physical house. But do you remember what the Davidic promise was? What was it? Yeah. Restoring the tabernacle of David. Restoring the tabernacle of David so that what would always be... David's descendants would always be on the throne. David's descendants would always be on the throne. Now, keep in mind, in Jesus' day, if Jesus had not been a descendant of David, they could have easily dismissed him saying, well, you're not even a son of David. But he was. So, so by implication, if David's descendants are always going to sit on the throne, the Messiah is going to live forever, then we can see that there. And then by figurative, figuratively, uh, by figurative types and shadows. I'm not going to read what this person writes, but I want you to think about what we know of the tabernacle and the temple. Hebrews 8 and 9 talks about all of those things are shadows of the real things in heaven. When you see the altar... Uh, in the tabernacle and temple, when you see the mercy seat, when you see the Holy of Holies, all of those things are, are figures of what the real heaven looks like. So when, when Jesus was teaching, and when we look at the New Testament, you have to understand that, yes, we need good, solid biblical foundation, but you have to give room for the Holy Spirit to impress upon you His room that sometimes we have to think outside the box and understand the bigger picture. That's why for some people the process of speaking in tongues is so tough to understand because they, they are uh, saying, well, I, I just can't prove dogmatically that the Bible says you, you should speak in tongues. I, I agree, you can't prove that dogmatically, but yet one thing I know is that people spoke in tongues, the Holy Spirit gives credence to it. I've experienced it in the churches around the world that are going fastest for Christ are the ones who use the gift of tongues. So, so there's that implication there. That I just want you to kind of help understand that when Jesus kind of scolded them, he was saying, guys, you've got to know the scriptures and then go with what the Holy Spirit is saying. you. Now, I know that kind of muddies some things, but does that help kind of help you understand it a little bit better? A little bit? All right. Now, I want to go to this question. Or actually, I want to go to, to chapter, uh, or chapter 20, verse 11. Now, we start to get to the resurrection scene itself. But Mary Magdalene stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Isn't that kind of a funny question? You know, it, it is a cemetery, or at least a tomb anyway. She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And understand, I don't mean to mock this. But a traumatic experience for Mary and, and all the women, all the disciples, just, just traumatic. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, 
she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, po- she supposed him to be the what? Gardener. I want you to keep that in mind. And said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away. So again, remember, earlier she tells Peter and John. They've carried him away. She tells the angel. Now she's telling the gardener, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Now I'm not quite sure how she was going to do that. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Uh, when he had spoken these things to her. So we're going to stop there for tonight. Well, at least as far as the text is concerned, but I've got a lot of questions. A lot of questions. So uh, when are we going to get done? We're going to get done when I'm done. All right, now, when I ask this question tonight, uh, these passages reveal a whole lot of questions for me. We're going to address these one by one. Number one, when did angels reveal themselves in the life of Jesus? Where? At his birth, at his temptation, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and at his resurrection. Four places here where we see this take place. Now, the angels were in the tomb, the very tomb that John and Peter were just in. Why did they see him? Their eyes weren't open, spiritual discernment. Maybe the angels weren't there at the time. Yeah, those are the three answers that I've come up with. Anyone want to add anything to that, Pat? You know, the compassion of God. Just like he wept with those weeping over Lazarus. He, he felt the pain of the ladies. I'm sure he felt a lot of pain too. But, yeah. but the ladies were crying. So he responds to tears and crying. Which leads into this question. He responds to pain. He responds to tears. Um, notice this next question. Why did Mary see the angels? John and Peter did not get... Maybe they weren't there. But why did Mary see the angel? Because she needed to. Comfort her. All God's plan, he's orchestrating this whole thing. So he has a plan who was going to see what, when, and how, yep. and why. Yep. I, I personally have not seen an angel as far as I know. Maybe I have, and I didn't realize it. But I, I know of people that I trust who have seen angels, perhaps you do as well. Pat, I remember you sharing a story of what, Pat, remember uh, you, this, this Pat, I got two Pats here, but 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 uh, I remember you sharing a story of angelic intervention, you know, and uh, you know, you didn't, I mean, you did see a light, right? That night on the road, on the highway. The, the sheet like behind me in my rear view mirror. Yeah, and uh, protected her. So I, I agree, angels. Mike? Give an illustration of something in our, in our lives, how some people can see the angel and these other people, but at the same moment, where when our son died, Marie and I were, watching, we were with Jerry, and he just died with some amazing look on his face, and awestruck that was something in the room was looking up at the ceiling. Now, Marie and I couldn't see anything, yeah. but we watched him watch with an angel or the Lord, whatever, coming for him. So yeah. there was that. They, they wanted, yeah, they, they allowed Jerry to see it, but they didn't allow Marie and I to see it in the same instant. And again, how old was he at the time? Three and a half. Three and a half when he died. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Charlie, I know your wife has told me before, she has seen angels in our sanctuary, it just, and, I, and I trust her. So how did Mary see the angel? Simply because, how, only because God allowed her to see with spiritual eyes. I, I believe in the ministry of angels. Cindy and I, we pray not to angels, but we pray for angels to impact our family members, protect them, keep them safe, intervene, fight against demonic things. But yet, I don't see them. But yet, Mary saw the angels, and perhaps the reason why she was given the opportunity to see the angels was because she was still looking for Jesus. Was it Peter and John or any of the other disciples that went to the tomb that morning? Mm-mm. They went to see the empty tomb. 
it was Mary and the others who came to see Jesus. It was Mary and the others who still had a heartbeat for him. The others were allowing, allowing the activities of the uh, weekend to really shake their faith. Now, next question. Uh, why did God choose Mary to be the first one to see the resurrected Christ? Do you ever wonder that? Um, you, you would think, I don't mean this to be sexist or chauvinistic, but you would think that, man, this, this is a man's religion. Come on, you know, let, let men be the first one to see and proclaim because women's testimonies weren't that good. But yet here we see that Mary Magdalene, the one who would not have even been allowed to be a participant in temple worship, was the one who was the first to see Jesus. Any speculation on why that might have been the case? So severely devoted to him no matter what, and she's shown it so many times. Mm -hmm. That's good. She was devoted. Kathy? Jesus treated women with much more respect than the culture of the day did. He did? He was showing, I believe, what was God's way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Women are not less than men. And I'm not saying it just for a woman. Women are not less than yeah. men. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, Paul said, neither female nor male. Pastor Josiah. He also was the principal of seeking his fire, and she was the first person that came looking. She was the first person that came looking. I, I like that. Anyone else? All right, I'm going to actually take that article I asked you about earlier to take out. This time I really mean it. Uh, but I, I want to read this article with you. Uh, I think this is a lady. I'm not sure. It's, the The blog was just anonymous, but it's, it is uh, written in a, in a website, uh, I forget the name of the website now. Um, what, what, what is, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's that, that website there. I don't have the website here, but I, I do have, uh, it, the, the name of the article is See Jesus in the Gardens, Undoing What Adam Did. All right, I want you to listen to this tonight. Um, my own garden is full of tulips and daffodils that are starting to fade now, but my cherry tree is still in bloom and dropping pink petals on the grass. The grass is bur bursting out of itself, growing too fast, uh, faster than a mower can keep up with, and the birds are singing as they wing over the plantings. Gardens are beautiful in the spring. Jesus' death and resurrection was in the spring, right around the time of Passover. Two gardens feature heavily in that story. There was the garden at Gethsemane, we're familiar with that, where he prayed and cried on the night he was arrested. And do not forget, guys, there was a garden where his body lay entombed. When Adam and Eve first sinned, it was in a what? They were driven out of the garden by an angel with a flaming sword. In the garden stories of Gethsemane and the tomb, angels appear again. Gardens, temptation, angels, death turning points. I think that when we see Jesus in gardens, in narratives that repeat so many of the motifs of Eden, it's good to pay special attention. Jesus, after all, is called the what? All right, allow me to pause here for a second, because this, this is a little illustration of what we talked about a moment ago. We are taking a text, and, and we're going to handle this delicately and carefully. Does anywhere in the Bible specifically say, Hey, you know, this is, this is definitely a fulfillment of, of Garden of Eden. No. But from what we know of Scripture, it wouldn't be beyond God to make all of this line up. Listen, if Jesus made the Passover line up, if Jesus made the Festival of First Fruits line up, I've talked about the day of Pentecost. Uh, I don't want to get into this tonight, but the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost had what? Fully come. Not just when the day of Pentecost had come, NIV, but the fully come. It was the day of Pentecost had fully reached its, its consummation. And so if God can do all this, I don't think it was beyond his realm of possibility to say, hey guys, as Adam and Eve blew it in a garden, Jesus won it in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and then as you're going to see, a woman was involved in the garden as well. Let me read that paragraph again. I think that when we see Jesus in gardens and narratives that repeat so many of the motifs of Eden, it's good to pay special attention. Jesus, after all, is called the second Adam. Matthew and Mark tell the story of the place called Gethsemane. But it is John who informs us that the place where Jesus withdrew after the Last Supper was in fact a garden. 
The original readers, of course, would have recognized the name of this garden at the foot of Mount of Olives, which is how Luke describes it in chapter 22 without having to be told. But Luke, but look what Jesus does in the garden. Going a little farther, he fell uh, with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be passed from me, yet not as I, but your will be done. The passage uh, says he prayed this way how many times? Three times. Three is an interesting number because that is the number of times Jesus asked Peter to reverse his denial of him. It is the number of times that Jesus resisted the temptations of the devil in the wilderness. Adam and Eve were tempted just once and they did fell, uh, did, and they fell. Uh, can I just say this though? Adam and Eve, when they were tempted though, they were tempted with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So they were te uh, tempted with three things. Jesus, as the second Adam, resisted three times. Somehow, there, the three is the number of reversal of undoing what has been done. Adam in the garden at Eden, all of his life ahead of him, in a place of joy and peace, chose his own will over God's. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is in agony of distress for the death he is facing, gasp out three affirmations of God's will. And an angel comes, not with a flaming sword to drive him out, but with outstretched arms to strengthen and comfort. And then there was the other garden. At the place where Jesus was crucified, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the place a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The narratives give several significant versions of what happened next, just as we might expect if a number of people all told individual eyewitness stories. But several, several elements appear over and over again. The stone was rolled away from the entrance of the tomb. Angels appeared, again, not to drive out, but this time to proclaim, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the first to see and speak to the risen Christ were women. I want to focus on the story in John. And let me just have you go down to the end of that passage uh, and pick up. Uh, where do I want to pick up here? I'm sorry. Where's, where's that article end for you guys? Uh, one thing is that one thing stands out. No, Mary. Yeah, let me pick up. One thing stands out immediately. Mary didn't see Jesus just because she happened to be the first one there. Jesus could have easily appeared to Peter and John, but he didn't. He waited until they had gone home. Then he appeared to Mary. Why? In the first garden, the Garden of Eden, the woman who listened to the serpent was thinking about her own gain. She saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom. And so she took and she ate. In this garden, the one with the empty tomb, the woman isn't thinking about herself at all. She's thinking about something else. She's thinking about someone else. Three times she says it. They have taken him away. Where is he? The third time he answers, her himself, Mary. She rushes into his arms and won't let go. Just as Jesus reversed what Adam did, Mary has reversed what Eve did. But he has something he needs her to do, something he chose her and not Peter or John to do. So he must ask her to let go of him and do it. After the scene in the Garden of Eden, God warned, God warned Eve that now her husband will rule over her. And what we see in biblical story from that time on is men ruling over women until Jesus came along. Any thoughts about that? How many of you got an interesting article? Listen, God reverses things. All right, we've got to hurry up here. Why didn't, why didn't, Jesus, why didn't, um, why didn't Mary recognize Jesus? Look at the screen. One, it was dark. Two, it was crowded in Jerusalem. And she, in three, she was emotionally distraught. Remember, we read earlier, it was still dark. Remember Jerusalem, Passover season, you know, probably one to two million people in that town. Even though it was the garden tomb, I'm still, it wasn't like just nice, serene, quiet place. But three, she was emotionally distraught. Emotionally distraught. Next question. Is there any significance to Mary thinking that Jesus was the gardener? We just looked at an article. Kathy, you're smiling. Thoughts? Pastor Josiah, are you just stretching? Yes, I am. You just stretching? Okay. 
I'm yeah. just thinking and go back to the, the other question, why didn't she recognize him? She was expecting to still find his dead body. Yep. I don't know, if you've ever been somewhere away from home and run into somebody that you used to know but you don't expect to see them in that context, yep. sometimes you have the same problem, even though you know the person, yep. it's like you can't quite figure out who they are because you don't expect to see them in that context. Yeah, yeah, that's a great fourth answer I should have written down is that, you know, she still believed Mary or Jesus was dead because she came to anoint him for death. Pat? So in the, sometimes in his heavenly body or his earthly resurrected body, he wants it recognized. Yeah, and, and, and I, I will give a little more, uh, a, a bit, bit different answer to, out of the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him. We know that to be true. This is speculation only on my part. I can't prove it. But yet a thought is this is unlike Mary who Mary and the others, the disciples who knew Jesus well, people of the road to Emmaus may not have necessarily known Jesus. They may have heard about him, but perhaps they did. They, we don't know for sure. But either way, Pat's right. They didn't, they didn't recognize him until what? Until he broke the bread. Until he, well, until he broke the bread. Now, what might be, and this is going to Luke 24 here, but why, why is it significant that when he broke bread, that then they recognized he was the Messiah. What do you think? Maybe they've been there with feeding the 5,000 or something. Okay, that's a good thought. Good thought. Let's think practical here and not too spiritual. Their hearts burn within them. Hearts burn within them. All right, Pat, can you just kind of turn, turn towards the middle section here? Just put your arms together. Pretend you're breaking bread. Possibly. Right. And Jesus disappears from her sight. Now, I want you to think about Adam's job. What was Adam's job? Adam the gardener. Take care of the animals. He was the gardener. Again, speculation on my part. But I can't help but think as Adam was the gardener, that Mary recognized the second Adam as the gardener. But he was so much more than a gardener. He was the caretaker of the world. Why do you suppose Mary recognized Jesus when she heard her name? And how can that com bring comfort to us? Why do, why do you think? She recognized his voice. How can that bring comfort to us? So many ways. <laughs> What's that? So many ways. So many ways. Kathy, what did you say? I recognize his voice. You recognize his voice. I know when he's talking to me. Now. You recognize someone's voice. It's a sense of it can be love, it can be security, it can be stability. If you trust that person, yep. have faith in that person. That's good. That's good. That's very good. Think about Mary's emotional state at this point. What was it? Again, she's distraught. She's a wreck. So she may not physically be able to see Jesus. Again, it's dark, it's crowded, there's other people probably around. Her tears, yes, she got tears. And even when he spoke, he didn't, still didn't quite recognize, but when he said her name, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of pain, in the midst of heartache, when he spoke her name, she heard it. Pastor Skip Heitzig put, says this, How often have you wondered where is God? Where is Jesus? Life is so hard. This is so bad. I can't believe I'm enduring this. Where is he? And he's right there. Right in front of you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, I will be with you always till the end of the world. He's right there. But by our sorrow, by our trial, we just miss him when he's right there. Look for him in the darkest, bleakest, earliest part of the morning, latest part of the evening, 
the hardest part of the trial. Look for him. When you look for him, you wonder where he is. I want to guarantee you, he's there. When you look for him hard enough, he's going to speak your voice, speak your name. Yeah, Charlie. Somebody posted on the workplace down in the hospital the other day. I think I showed it to you. When you things are rough and you wonder where God is, the teacher is always quiet during the test. Mm -hmm. Teachers are always quiet during the test. Except for I had one teacher in Bible college, Pastor or not, Professor Harris. It wasn't in our class, but it was another class where he had given his given his class a test, had a cord or had a headset microphone off, went to you went to use the restroom and forgot to turn the mic off, so he wasn't quiet during the test. <laughs> All right. All right, 27 more questions. No, not really. King James Version says in verse 17, touch me not. Would you look at somebody and say, touch me not? <laughs> the word is appropriately transliterated as do not cling or hold on to, is the NIV, to Jesus. Do not cling, do not hold on to me. What does Jesus mean when he says, don't cling to me, I am ascending to my Father? What do you think? I, 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 again, somewhat speculative, but I'm going to give, us, give you my best case scenario answer on this tonight. We've heard various interpretations through the years, through decades, if you're old enough. Charlie? The Bible says that when we go to heaven, we're getting a new, renewed body. Mm -hmm. Yep, new body. How many are glad for that? Yeah. That's probably the same situation Okay. Could be. Uh, Kathy? I always read that as he said, don't hold on to the physical me uh -huh. because you need to learn to hold on to the spiritual me, you know, living inside of you and all that. I think stuff. that's good. I don't preach. Anyone want to go a little further with that? Through the years, we've heard a lot of teaching. Um, perhaps that says, you know, he had a glorified body and, you know, he, he couldn't touch that glorified body until he actually went up to the heavens that night and came back down. I think, how, how many have heard that teaching before? I think that is even more speculative than what I'm about to say. To me, when I read this passage, what do I see? I see this. Mary is just so excited. I mean, why wouldn't she be? Uh, you know, there's there's a lady by the name of Ruth Dillow back in uh, the desert storm. She got the call. Her son had been killed in action. But then uh, one day he called home and said, hey, mom, it's me. And he wasn't dead after all. She, she, she says she was so excited. Mary had to have been so ecstatic. What's she going to do? Say, hey, cool, Jesus, you're alive. Give me a high five. That's cool. Let's, and then let's go out for breakfast. No. But of course, what's she going to do? She's going to hold on. Hold on. But Jesus knew this would take place. So for him, it's no surprise. It's kind of like, guys, I'm, I'm glad you're excited that you saw demons cast out. But listen, I saw lot, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's no big deal. I rose from the dead. I'm glad you're excited. It's no big deal. Really, really it isn't. I can do that. Mary's excited. So what does he give her the challenge to do? He tells her to do something. What's he tell her to do? Go and tell Peter and John. Matthew talks about go tell the disciples and tell them to go to where? To Galilee. And I'm going to meet with them there. He gives her a job to do. The time of ascension for him to go to heaven, it's not yet. It's 40 days later, 38 days later, somewhere around there. But Jesus says, look, I know you're excited. I'm paraphrasing now, but I know you're excited about seeing me, Mary. I get it. I'm happy to see you too. However, listen, we've got a job to do. I need you to go tell the disciples be the first preacher of the gospel of Christ, that I'm alive. She goes out, tells them. They don't believe it at first. They believe it when they see Jesus that night. And we're going to pick up next week with that story. But any, any thoughts? That's the last question I got tonight, unless you want to stay here for another hour. What, what do you want to... Any final thoughts, comments, questions? Charlie? This is not about what you were talking about tonight, but this solar eclipse 
coming up here in the next few days. When the, the day turned to night when he was on the cross for that time, I've heard people say that that was a solar eclipse. I, I don't, I, 99% sure would say no. Reason being, because astronomers, not, not astrologists, but astronomers, they're, they're, they always amaze me how detailed they can be. And they can go back and tell you the lunar cycle, they can tell you back the eclipses. And in, 30, in April of 30 AD, there were no solar eclipses. So, uh, and, and besides, it, it went dark. I, again, I, I think when we see the eclipse on, and, you know, and unless you go up to Rochester, you're not going to see the hardest part here of the eclipse. But it's not going to be dark, dark, dark. I mean, it'll still be, you'll still be able to see. It'll be neat, but it's not going to be dark. Whereas you look at the word that's dark, uh, use the word dark in, in the book of John. Um, it is a word that means like dark, not just cloudy or shadowy, but dark. So it's a good thought, though. Va valid thought. Anyone else? Uh, oh, yeah, it's Christine. Solar eclipses don't last that long. They don't last three hours. They don't last three hours. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, they don't last three hours. So good, good point. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, one final question here. Not up here, but I'll ask this. Give me a takeaway that ministers to you tonight. Give me a takeaway that ministers to you tonight. One hand at a time, please. One hand at a time. <laughs> Give me a takeaway that ministers to you tonight. Kathy? Sometimes all I need to hear is Jesus not say my name, drag my attention away from whatever it is I'm working Yeah. On. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes all we need to do is hear Jesus drag. Uh, say our name and drag our attention to whatever got us preoccupied. Debbie? I honestly believe that we can all have that same close feeling that Mary has. It just depends on you just have to let everything go and have total faith and you can feel it and you can hear him and you really can you can get everything they had. It's not just a, a story. Yeah. True. But it takes us intentionally getting to know Jesus, too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? We tend to preach about the Jesus that we touch. Yeah. And the, and the Jesus we've had to physically let go of, but spiritually, yeah. we're still holding on to or to continue to yeah. preach that gospel. Yeah. Hold on to Jesus, but when it's time to let go, you still preach the, the, the uh, spiritual gospel as well. Mm -hmm. Mike, anything from you? <laughs> You know, I've, I've been on the cold all day working, but, uh, <laughs> and I was trying to um, track you when you were talking about how Jesus undid so many things in, in the Garden of Eden as um, compared to the, the Garden of Gethsemane and this, this situation here. And I, I tracked most of it, but that was really good to, for me to, to see those things. I never heard that before. Yeah. Those, those, Things that he reversed in this moment. Yeah, it, again, it's just those little things where you just say, God, you amaze me. Charlene will close. When you were a child and one of your parents called your name, nobody else could call you that same way. So you knew who they were. And I think that was the same situation with Mary and Jesus. And even now, you can know when God speaks to you. Hallelujah. Pastor Josiah, would you close us in prayer tonight? Lord, we thank you so much that you are the resurrection and the life. God, we thank you that the tomb is empty and that you're alive. We thank you that you have given us new hope of resurrection. We, we thank you that you've given us newness of life. And uh, Lord, we just give you all the glory, with all and praise. We ask that you continue to help us to grow up in our understanding and knowledge of the power of the resurrection that works in us as we believe and trust in you. We thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for all that you've done to give us freedom and victory, and that you are the conquering king. Yes. And we just give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Chris. I've been honored to be the lead pastor of Greater Valley Assembly of God for over 22 years, and so far it's been a great adventure. 
Thank you so much for joining us online today. I'm so glad you did. Our desire here is to help people continually develop in their relationship with Jesus Christ through relevant biblical messages, contemporary worship, and great fellowship in an atmosphere where you will feel relaxed and sense the presence of God. If you'd ever like to get in touch with us, feel free to contact us. Or, even better yet, visit us on a Sunday morning at 1045 a.m. or on a Wednesday night at 630 p.m. in Athens, Pennsylvania. May God continue to richly bless you and prosper you in body, soul, and spirit.